Good afternoon. I'm so happy you could all make this event. Uh, it hasn't been a tradition that we have State of the School presentations, uh, but I think with everything going on and the size and scale of our enterprise, it's a healthy thing uh, to do just to try to, to catch up at least at one point in the year. So what I plan to cover today, particularly given our 250th birthday, is first to begin with a historical context. Then I want to present a series of examples of innovation at Penn Medicine and the impact that it's having. Then I'll talk about the external environment, some of the changes that are happening, the challenges that creates, and coupled to those challenges, some of the solutions that we have in mind. And in the end, I think I'll show you a bright horizon uh, for what we think the future will look like. And you'll understand, if you didn't know already, why you want to be at Penn Medicine <laughs> and why so many faculty around the country and, and aspiring students uh, want to be at Penn Medicine. So let me begin by thanking a, a number of people. And obviously, I won't recognize everyone. Uh, but beginning with, with the university leadership, we have terrific support from President Gutman and Provost Price and our Board of Trustees for everything that we do at Penn Medicine. Uh, the leadership at the health system, Ralph Muller and many of his colleagues who are here, uh, do a superb job uh, working hard every day uh, to advance the clinical mission. The vice deans and the vice presidents, also many of them uh, here today. And I particularly want to recognize Glenn Galton, who has served uh, for 20 years to help spearhead uh, so many of our research efforts. Glenn's not uh, here today, uh, but you all know how much he's done to help advance the research enterprise. And John Epstein uh, is here today and will be helping us shape the future of the research enterprise going forward. But most importantly, I want to recognize our faculty who in each mission area spearhead what we do and make Penn Medicine a great place and the students who inspire us every day whether medical students or postdocs, uh, to be our very best as, as faculty members. So let's begin with this historical context. Uh, you all know that we're celebrating our 250th birthday. This will culminate on May 16th when we have a celebration, part of which will be back up in this space. And we'll also have a gala event at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I hope all of you have signed up uh, because it's already sold out. Uh, <laughs> The, the ticket prices uh, will continue to escalate on the black market. Uh, but this, this slide uh, shows our founder, John Morgan. And I think what's important about this slide is that the values that he established at the founding of the school still make sense. Uh, there was a choice. Uh, a couple of models had been put forward for the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And his idea was that it should be linked inextricably to a great university so that medicine would always have a strong scientific basis and linkage to other disciplines at the same time that clinical training took place uh, at the Pennsylvania Hospital. And the alternate model, which was more of an apprenticeship model within the hospital, uh, was declined by the Board of Trustees. And so this sounds like the precursor to the Flexner Report. In many ways, it was. And it's as true today, it still makes sense uh, as it did then. I've highlighted uh, here just a, a few of the many milestones that have occurred in the, in the history of Penn Medicine. You see on the far left, uh, Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, but also recognized as the father of the field of psychiatry. Uh, still a very, very strong uh, discipline here. Just to the right is one of the very first x-ray images. So at the time that Rentgen was beginning to recognize the, the physics behind x-ray and the fact that these images uh, could be developed, there were uh, physicists at Penn who had very similar observations. Uh, didn't come out quite as, as early with those, but I'll show you later how this field has changed in, in a then and now sort of comparison. Now, you may be wondering uh, who this person is. Uh, this is Christian Lambertson. 
he founded the field of, of scuba. And the thing that was driving him was an effort to have a rebreathing apparatus so that Navy uh, SEAL precursors uh, would be able to use these in battle. And of course, this advanced uh, pulmonary physiology as, as well as its original effort. And we've got uh, next Peter Knoll, the identification of the Philadelphia chromosome. At the time this discovery was made, the tradition was that you, you would name the discovery the genetic change based on the city in which it was discovered. Uh, in addition to that specific observation, this is arguably the beginning of our understanding of the molecular basis of cancer, in some ways the beginnings of precision medicine in which, based on a specific diagnostic test and molecular abnormality, we can now target therapies, in this case, uh, Gleevec for CML. This is the first critical care unit. This concept emerged from the idea that certain patients on the hospital floors had severe but reversible illness, that with intensive support, they would be able to survive. Again, it's a concept that we struggle with to balance how we use our CCUs and ICUs. And you'll see at the end uh, where we're going with our new trauma center as yet another evolutionary step of this concept. This is the first video transmission of a surgical procedure. Uh, this is peptic ulcer surgery at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And the beloved Tim Beck, who among other things, advanced the field of cognitive behavioral therapy, received the Lasker Award uh, for that uh, skill set and, and tool that's used. But he has made a number of other observations, including assessments of suicide risk. So you, you see a series of advances. There are uh, hundreds of others I could show. But let me just uh, compare how things have changed uh, in the recent past. So we've got over here an operating theater. You see an auditorium. This is one of the original x-ray uh, machines in the Pepper laboratory. And here's a research laboratory. Here's the modern operating theater. You're in this room for education. Uh, of course, the laboratories have changed dramatically, and, uh, and imaging and proton uh, therapy for uh, radia uh, radiation oncology have changed tremendously. So let's talk about a, a few of the advances that have happened more recently. And I have to be selective, of course. But I want to give you some sense for how innovation is occurring here. The first example is that of some work of Raina Merchant, a faculty member in emergency medicine who also works with the Penn Center for Healthcare Innovation. Many of you are aware of her use of crowdsourcing as a way to identify the locations of defibrillators in the city of Philadelphia. But she's advanced that concept to now use crowdsourcing as a way to design images like the one shown here and to rate them. Uh, which ones are most effective. And this idea of using crowdsourcing and social media techniques uh, now has an entire laboratory associated with it. On the right side, you see work of, of Brian Litt, a member of the neurology department, uh, a specialty interest in, in epilepsy. Uh, he's formed a very deep and rich collaboration with the School of Engineering. And this has really been a synergistic relationship. Brian's goal, and, and others in this field, is to be able to develop better methods for detecting electrophysiological events, and with that information, to predict ahead of time when a seizure will occur, with a long-term goal to be able to interrupt that prophylactically in a way not unlike how we use uh, defibrillators, automated defibrillators now, for cardiac arrhythmias. What was, what was essential for this to work, and this paper describes it, is the use of, of graphene materials, you know, very thin, uh, transparent materials that have the special characteristic that you get a combination of spatial resolution and electrophysiological recordings that gives a new form of data, but massive amounts of data that have to be processed with algorithms. So Brian, again, uh, used crowdsourcing as a way to develop the optimal algorithm, 
the most predictive method for when the seizure event would occur in the intensive care unit. And they found a much higher number of seizures than was originally recognized. And the winners were not faculty members at, at Penn. Uh, they were people outside the field of medicine, one, one team in Australia and one in Singapore, who were able to develop these, these algorithms. Here are a couple of additional examples. You see the, the work of Bihan. I'll let you guess what she's holding in that, in that test tube, because she's gone, her team has gone into the field in Africa to collect uh, samples of, of DNA with a goal of trying to identify the evolutionary origins of HIV and malaria, among other diseases. And what they found by doing classical uh, genetic studies is that there were, were bottlenecks in the transmission of these uh, viruses. And as SIV uh, evolved into HIV, largely in the chimpanzee population, it was apparently transmitted to humans uh, through uh, bushmeat. And what you can also uh, see in her work is that there are cross-species innate immune system barriers that, that block a lot of this transmission. So mechanistically, trying to understand how the innate immune system creates these cross-species barriers is a critical step. Uh, Ken Zarat is, is here with us today, has worked on the concept of, of pioneering transcription factors. So all the more appropriate that he's identified as a, as a pioneering uh, faculty member. But the idea here is that when cells are pluripotential, there must be a cascade of, of genetic and signaling events that takes them through the differentiation pathway to ultimately uh, develop more differentiated characteristics. But there are a subset of transcription factors, the pioneering ones, that have the unique capability to initiate this process, to find the, the areas of the human genome that are really locked down very tightly through epigenetic marks. And then they're able to unlock these uh, regions of the genome and allow other components of the cascade uh, to have access and ultimately uh, play out this differentiation pathway. Now, I've summarized, I'm sure, inadequately and quickly uh, with a lot of complex work. Uh, there are teams of people involved in these projects, and they thrive at Penn because there's a lot of interactions among our faculty to brainstorm about these projects and bring various skills, whether it's next generation sequencing, uh, modeling data, or new cell systems. One of the ways we try to assess uh, the impact of this innovative work is to look at the journals that you all know well, the top 20 journals in science and medicine, and not only count the papers, which average around 250 a year, but to try, to try to review these papers with an eye towards what are the critical success factors. And often, it's because faculty are collaborating outside their traditional department or discipline with other people at, at Penn. 250 a year, there's almost a paper a day coming out of Penn Medicine in the New England Journal, Cell, Nature, Science, JAMA. And you see the spectrum of work here that ranges from studies of policy to studies about how the stromal cells uh, can interact with, say, epithelial cells for drug resistance, the role that the circadian uh, pathway has early in life on subsequent uh, function. So there's tremendous uh, depth and range of activities here at Penn Medicine. One of the areas that we've been very interested to focus on is precision medicine and advanced medicine as a way to be differentiated. Uh, precision medicine is now a popular buzzword. It's arguably always been an important part of what we do. But the pace is accelerating, and this field is changing. When patients develop an infection, the first thing we want to do is identify the responsible organism, and then based on that, know what the drug sensitivity is. That's an example of, of precision medicine. So it's not a brand new field. But what's changing is that the taxonomy of disease is getting 
more and more subdivided over time. This is particularly true in most forms of cancer, where instead of just thinking about the organ of location, like lung cancer, we want to understand the, mo the molecular underpinnings so that the treatments can be uh, appropriately targeted to the molecular abnormalities, or the prognosis can be better understood. So I think in many ways, uh, we are precision medicine at Penn Medicine. We want to develop better diagnostic tests, tailored treatments, and as much as we focus on quality and safety, and we should, uh, what often isn't given adequate attention is, is actually getting the diagnosis right in the first place. So being great diagnosticians and using the tools that we have to work with, whether it's imaging, laboratory tests, or clinical skills, uh, will help our patients uh, be cured or better managed, and it will help differentiate us in the marketplace. On the right side, I, I give an example of advanced medicine, and I'll tell a very brief vignette of an undergraduate student, a baseball player, who was home for the holidays. He was working out in the gym, didn't feel well, developed a very high fever, muscle aches. It looked like a, a severe flu was developing. He went to the hospital uh, in Princeton, uh, rapidly decompensated, developed lung failure, and even with intubation, uh, was not going to do very well. So with, with consultation with the team there and the family, a decision was made to transfer him to Penn at Presbyterian Hospital, where ECMO is available. This is a, a form of of pulmonary oxygenation, uh, and it's often used during cardiac bypass surgery. But uniquely, what we're able to do is to carry out ECMO in transport, as well as when people arrive at the hospital. So this protocol was, was used. Uh, I've, been, I've been told his clinical course, it was a challenging one, the recovery was difficult, but it happened. Now think back to the first intensive care unit. Uh, this is why the idea of ICUs was developed, is to try to identify circumstances in which diseases might be reversible with appropriate intensive intervention. A couple of years ago, uh, we wanted, as a result of the strategic plan, to shine a light on the master clinicians at Penn Medicine. And there are hundreds of master clinicians at Penn Medicine, but the process is just beginning. In the first class, we identified about 25. The inaugural uh, group that helped found this had been the master clinicians awarded uh, each year as part of our award ceremony. Last week, uh, we inducted the group shown in the photograph here. Now, many of you will, will know uh, who these individuals are. Uh, master clinicians are those you would want to send a family member to. They're those you want to refer your patients to. They've got terrific clinical skills. They work incredibly well with their colleagues. They communicate well with their patients. And it's, all, it's appropriate that we recognize them, but it's not just to shine a light on the master clinicians so they can feel good. We've charged them to be role models for the medical students and residents. Time has been carved out so that they can transfer these skills allow the students and residents to imprint on them, uh, because there's so much of the hidden curriculum that we recognize well but have a hard time teaching explicitly. Now, on the, on the far right here, we've got Ursina Teitelbaum. You can see Ralph failed to hold up his side of the plaque there. <laughs> uh, but many of you know her. Uh, she, she's a clinical specialist in biliary and pancreatic oncology, this is not an area with a good prognosis. But she's got the clinical skills to help patients with chemotherapy and other treatments when appropriate. But she's also able to steer them towards hospice when that makes sense. Uh, she also helps them identify their bucket list. It's, it's the full spectrum of care that we need to, to deliver. Part of it's clinical, but part of it's also compassionate. This is the next generation of master clinicians. This is uh, also last week, the group of Alpha Omega Alpha <coughs> AOA students. 
So by definition, they need to be at the top of the class, a class which is already extraordinary. But in addition to that, they've got other characteristics that make them stand out. Uh, some of them have done important biomedical research. Others have done great volunteer work. I don't know who's on this selection committee, Gail. It can't be a, an easy job because 80% of our medical students volunteer during their four plus years. Over 60% of them receive additional degrees during their training. And all of them you know, go on to be great alumni and, and most of them actually leaders in academic medicine. So let, let me point out uh, just a, a couple of, of people who I've had a chance to spend a bit more uh, time with. So this, this will be uh, soon a medical correspondent and dermatologist, soon to be Dr. Goldbach. So she's volunteered in Botswana. Uh, she's done great things all through medical school, but she's also apprenticed as a medical correspondent trying to translate what we do uh, to the general public. Uh, we've got art history majors here. Uh, there are two uh, MD, PhD students, Chuka, who's standing in the back, has used CRISPR technology to knock out, uh, working with Bob Doms and, and others, both CCR4 and CCR5, to study the function of these immune cells and has identified the fact that they still function well as immune cells without these entry vehicles for HIV virus. But he's also volunteered in West Philadelphia to help women in the postpartum state uh, with weight management. He's a member of our a cappella uh, group. <laughs> so you, you see the, the skills of these uh, students who will someday uh, be master clinicians. In fact, all of us in the room uh, who are teaching these students have to work very hard uh, to stay in front of them. Now, I mentioned the fact that uh, the external environment is changing. You, you know this slide as the perfect storm. It's the convergence of, of three hurricanes uh, predominantly in the New England area. Uh, when I go to a meeting of, of deans, it is really grim. Uh, I mean, people talk about the fact, and there's merit in, in all of these concerns, NIH funding is not what it used to be. The world of clinical reimbursement is changing. <coughs> there are threats to graduate medical education, and I'm sure each of you have these concerns and your colleagues have these concerns. And when you go to meetings, uh, this is often the topic of conversation. But I don't think the sky is falling. Uh, these conversations have been had off and on for decades. We've been around 250 years, and we're going to be around another 250 years. And our job is to steward the institution and the resources that we have and navigate these external challenges successfully and thrive. It may not be easy, but I'm absolutely convinced that we can do it. We've got the right people. We've got the right governance model. We've got the right ideas with our strategic plan. And so in the next few slides, I want to show you just a few examples of, of activities, many from the strategic plan, but others, other activities that have happened uh, even since that plan was created. And I want to begin with the culture of Penn Medicine. And I'll begin with that because it's arguably the most important feature of why we will be successful. So I've sometimes entitled this slide, The Secrets of Success at Penn Medicine. Uh, so you'll now be in on the secret. Now, the first part is the recognition that we have here excellence without arrogance. I don't take this for granted at all, because there are very different models where you also aspire to excellence, but it, it may not be with the absence of arrogance. You can have a, a model where the selection of excellence is so intense that it leads to a lot of internal comp uh, competition for scarce resources. It's a survival at the fittest model, and that, that model can work. But it has consequences. 
And one of the consequences is that the next part, which is a collaborative culture, has difficulty existing if you've got arrogance and if you've got intense internal comp uh, competition. So the second feature is I, I deeply believe that there's a linkage between uh, the first two. And we've got a robust collaborative culture here. The third uh, value that you see listed is inclusion and diversity. Here is a way to achieve innovation and impact. I think any way you want to look at diversity, it's a strategy for success. It's a way to foster teamwork, teamwork that will uh, lead to more creative ideas. It's a, it's a way to em embrace a broader set of ideas. It's a, it's a way to cultivate creative thinking. And in many aspects of what we do, it's a way to be more effective. Certainly, we need diversity in the clinical environment to take better care of a broad array of, of people who have different backgrounds and ideas about the field of medicine, access to medicine. Penn has always been a champion of professionalism in the field of medicine. Various societies a few uh, years ago, led by the ABIM and the ACP and others, published a, a document on professionalism. And it's critical that we revisit these ideas of altruism and justice on a frequent basis, because this is the underpinning of the culture that we have in, in science and medicine. And at Penn, arguably more than any other place I can think of, we're a fully integrated organization. This positions us to adapt and thrive going forward because our missions are so interdependent. You, you all know this, but it's worth underscoring how the research and the clinical care and the teaching at, a, at an advanced academic medical center depend on, on one another. And because we have a, an organization in which the health system, the medical school, and the university are all tied together, uh, we're able to adapt to some of these external changes in a very creative and successful way. All of this is, is an effort to achieve innovation and impact, a theme that you've heard throughout virtually every slide that, that I've showed. So here's one way that we've been mapping the strategic plan. Uh, it's not very hard to come up with ideas for a strategic plan. In fact, the ideas that you would come up with are probably shared among most of the academic medical centers around the country. The secret of success is the implementation of the plan that's put forward. So we've been tracking this from the very beginning with color codes that are green, yellow, and red, and not you know, all of the individual elements are listed here. Uh, but you can see that as you read through these that we've been very successful in the implementation. There's really no red on this chart uh, and the, the rest that aren't shown here. The areas that are yellow are really going to be long-term efforts that will always be there for us. I think we may never uh, fully achieve what we want in tech transfer and innovation because you can always do more. We can probably never do as much as we think we could in local and global engagement with the community. So I think a few years from now, they're likely to be yellow, but we should continue uh, to strive. Otherwise, uh, many of these are more uh, time dependent, and you'll, you'll see uh, examples as I go through of some of the facilities plans to support uh, both research and, and clinical care. Now, I'm going to spend some time on, on this slide because there, there could be 20 or 30 data slides behind this, but I think I can, can convey, more importantly, this information in a single slide. So in the middle, you see the interdependent missions. And no plan can succeed unless you've got the, res the right resources to support it. And these resources are not created equally, so it's important that we understand the, the relative uh, scale involved. So on the top, because we're an integrated organization, we're able to use clinical revenue to help support our academic and our clinical missions going forward. 
in aggregate, the health system is about a $5 billion enterprise. It's relatively large on the scale of academic medical centers. Keith Casper, the CFO, has developed a model where it's very important that the health system consistently achieve at least a 4% operating margin for the long term. Now, fortunately, that operating margin has been exceeded in the last few years. And after the transfers to the academic enterprise, you still need to achieve at least a 2% margin to continue to reinvest in the clinical enterprise so that it thrives going forward. So we track this very, very carefully and model it consistently because our goal needs to be a long-term goal. We're not an entity that's focused on you know, quarterly returns and short-term gain. Uh, we're one of the institutions that will be around for hundreds of years. So it requires that long-term uh, financial planning. Now, behind those margins is a huge amount of, of work, both to, to manage the expenses, but also to generate uh, new and, and creative forms of, of healthcare delivery. Now, immediately adjacent, you see grant funding, uh, well known to many of you in the room. Uh, we bring in over $600 million a year of grants in total. About two-thirds of that, about $400 million, is from the National Institutes of Health. We've been quite successful despite the challenges in maintaining our grant funding. In fact, we're up year over year uh, for the last couple of years despite the falling pay lines. Rebecca Cook and her team who have been tracking this uh, have recognized that we've got more proposals going out this year than we did in the previous couple of years. So we think, we think the grant support looks favorable. We think the operating uh, margins are favorable. The investment performance is a critical part of the long-term financial success of an institution like Penn because our endowments and our investments, to the extent that they have good returns, allow us to reinvest for the long term. And the university as a whole has had very good investment performance in the last several years, even during the economic downturn uh, compared to some of our peers. As a long-term objective, you would like to see university endowment returns at 10% or greater. So these, these top three are really you know, quite large and, and important sources of revenue to support our plan, our research, and the renewal of our clinical activities. Penn broadly, and Penn Medicine specifically, have also done very well with philanthropy. Uh, when the, when the uh, campaign ended, the university had raised $4.3 billion above its goal. Penn Medicine had raised $1.3 billion above our goal of $1 billion. And we have sustained that level of fundraising since the campaign ended. Our goal this year, which was raised from last year, is to raise $150 million or more. And we're on track to do that. During the campaign, we had one of the largest uh, gifts to a medical school, the naming gift from the Perlman family, 225 million. And you're all aware of the very significant programmatic support we've had in, in a whole range of areas, the number of chairs that have been raised. So I would also highlight the importance of philanthropy and your participation in conveying the excitement about what we do and the opportunities to support uh, the research and our faculty uh, through philanthropy. Perhaps the most rapidly changing area is with the industry par uh, partnerships. Through sponsored research agreements, through uh, collaborative uh, projects, through royalties that start to come back, uh, new startup companies. This is a critical area for us to be engaged in and one where our translational research themes are well suited to engage with the private sector. Uh, increasingly, research and development in the device and pharmaceutical industry uh, is being done in a different way where they're looking more to academic medical centers as a way to develop the early stage research and then engage in later stages uh, through sponsored research agreements or clinical trials. And while tuition may not be on the scale of some of these other revenue sources, 
I would highlight really a different goal here, which is, is to find scholarship and financial aid support for graduate students and medical students to offset the debt burden that they might have when they graduate so that their career choices can be more open-minded and so that we'll attract the best people into the field of medicine. The bottom line from these slides is that we're in a very good financial position, among the strongest financial positions in the country. And this is enabling us to enact the strategic plan, which is the way that we're adapting to the changes in the external environment. And these ideas have bubbled up uh, from all of you in the room and others who aren't here today. Really creative ideas that have, have helped us respond so effectively to the changes outside. So I'm going to highlight a few additional examples of what's happening through the strategic plan and even since. Uh, here are a couple of slides from the opening of the Pennovation Center uh, just a few months ago. Now, you may wonder what uh, Amy Gutman is, is holding here. Uh, this is the device that was used uh, to launch the robotics, the drones that flew up behind along with a, with a number of balloons. But this will be a physical site where we can develop new startup companies that will be close uh, to the Penn campus. This is the interview uh, with, with Walter Isaacson, a really interesting interview about the origins of computer science here at, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, at the beginning of, of that field. And what may surprise some of you over here on, on the very far right is the relative ranking of the University of Pennsylvania in the biotech sector. This is a publication from Nature Biotechnology where they developed a series of quantitative metrics to compare uh, various university systems in the biotechnology space. We were second to the entire University of California system. And they, the, the metrics here are things like the number of patents that have been issued, the number of new startup companies, the relative development of uh, recently launched companies. I think we can do even better. And we are actively engaged in, in doing better in this space. And th the main reason to get involved in this entrepreneurial activity is because this brings our ideas, it brings our research closer to something of practical value for society. And so this is really exciting. I think uh, we're an institution that is, is certainly on the move. And this was one of the three uh, main goals that came out of that strategic plan. This is a slide that uh, Eve Higginbotham has allowed me to borrow. And I already talked about the importance of diversity as a way to innovate. What this slide captures is how deeply engaged in diversity we are in different components of our enterprise. So I'll highlight just a few of these. The Alliance of Minority Physicians is a grassroots effort to engage across specialty areas at the graduate level, attached you know, strongly to our, our GME programs. Uh, we formally launched a program in, in LGBT health last year. Uh, we have a long-standing and successful uh, program for diversity in, in undergraduate medical education. Very few places have any organizational structure for postdocs, much less a, a diversity effort for postdoctoral fellows. And here we have one for uh, the BGS program. The focus program that does research as well as engagement in leadership uh, for women. Our faculty affairs office is among the, the best in the country, I'm sure. They've trained over 50 diversity search advisors and are now uh, helping some of the other schools around the university develop diversity search advisors. The clinical footprint is rapidly expanding. I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of this. The, the times have long since passed when most of the clinical activity took place right here on this campus at HUP, when both inpatient and outpatient activities were largely circumscribed within HUP. Then we expanded Presbyterian, Pennsylvania Hospital. But the world is moving into the outpatient sector. 
over 55% of our activity is now outpatient activity. So you know well the older sites, uh, like Radnor. We recently integrated Chester County Hospital with their many outpatient facilities. We're developing collaborative new outpatient facilities at Parksburg, uh, Southern Chester County. You see a, a future site at Summers Point uh, with the Shore Hospital system and an expansion at Cherry Hill. It's important that we engage in this refreshed look at the clinical environment because there's much more emphasis now on population health, on coordination of care as patients go back and forth between the health system and the outpatient environment. This gives us a larger footprint for clinical trials, for referrals, for advanced care, and the health system has been doing a wonderful job of planning these developments. Each one of these efforts requires very detailed and careful planning, and they've just done a spectacular job. And I'll show a few specific examples on this next slide. Now, amazingly, all of these activities have occurred really within the last couple of years. Kevin Mahoney, uh, we've, we've now cloned. You see, one, you see one of Kevin back here. We've got a couple of others around because he, he and his team have been so actively engaged in developing new facilities at Penn Medicine Washington Square, close to the uh, Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, last year, the Penn Medicine University, this is in the fall, opened, largely focused on musculoskeletal care, other outpatient uh, surgeries. We're in the Jordan Medical Education Center. Only in the last few weeks has this pavilion for advanced care opened at Penn Presbyterian and is the locus for our new trauma center and emergency room. I'll say more about that in a minute. And behind, really on, on top of us, you see the Center for Advanced Cellular Therapeutics. So we're, we're just over here in the auditorium. We'll have the reception in the new medical education center space here. Now, there are really important renovations also planned. Stemler Hall, the former home of the, many of the medical school facilities and our research laboratories, particularly for the surgical areas, will undergo a complete renovation. This will cost over $100 million, but it will be brand new laboratory space. The Richards Building, which has four uh, separate towers, is also undergoing a complete renovation and will have a lot of neuroscience and informatics, among other activities. So these are the kinds of reinvestments that I was talking about that are so critical to our long-term future. I want to highlight the transition of trauma, which just occurred really for several reasons. First, it exemplifies the careful planning. Many, many people were involved. Bill Schwab, certainly, in uh, trauma surgery. Jill Barron, who's here in emergency medicine. Pat Wren, in, in human resources and, and nursing, because over 200 personnel were shifted in order to make this happen. But they've been planning this for years. Trauma impacts virtually every clinical department. And it's part of a larger effort by Penn Medicine to have more coordinated care across departments in an area that we sometimes refer to as service lines. So we now have advanced service lines in cancer, women's health, neuroscience, cardiovascular disease, musculoskeletal, and now trauma. This will not only provide better trauma care for patients, but it will allow our colleagues who formerly were in emergency medicine, in trauma surgery, in critical care, in anesthesia, to think about this field as a more cohesive field. This is the kind of thing that Penn Medicine does exceptionally well. This is one of the only examples that we're aware of where an entire trauma service has moved completely uh, within an institution from one site to another site. This will open up additional beds within HUP. So part of the strategy here was to improve the trauma, but also to allow us to move uh, other kinds of activities within HUP so that we can carry out 
more bone marrow transplants, more solid organ transplants, take care of, of more patients in the intensive care unit. Now, as we look forward, uh, anyone who's been here for more than 10 years has heard discussions about the renewal of HUP. That day has now come. Uh, the plans are beginning to come into place to develop a new HUP on the site of the Penn Tower uh, that, that you see in this photograph, now gone. Now, don't take this image uh, too literally. Kevin Mahoney uh, reminds me, because actually this plan has an important theme, which is to design from the inside out, to begin with the needs of the patient and the patient's room, and then once that's set, to have the outside structure and the design of the building support the needs of the patient and the healthcare team. So it has an inside-out design, but it also has a keen uh, contextual view of fitting into the Penn campus broadly. You can see the curved structure as an initial way of thinking that we pick up elements of the museum, the Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine, the CHOP structure, so that it blends in more fully with the campus. The possibility to go between the museum and the hospital from the subway stop uh, straight into the campus and ultimately along Hamilton Walk all the way to the vet school is part of the integration into the Penn campus more broadly. Features in the patient's room still being developed, the use of light, reduction of noise, the use of, of media tools so that patients can relate uh, to their family through Skype or by rotating photographs, or so that physicians or nurses can do teaching within the patient's room. Uh, this is going to be very, very exciting. There are a number of challenges, not the least of which is that we can't snap our fingers and make this happen. It will need to be phased because it's very costly. That will allow us to respond to what's going on in the external environment. Uh, Penn Tower has to come down. Hopefully, we'll have everyone out before that happens. <laughs> Uh, there'll be a number of, of changes associated with this, including a temporary bridge that you'll be updated on in a continuous way. Uh, but this, this is an important event. But I also want to underline what I said before. There's a lot of activity moving outpatient. So with all the focus that we have on hospital facilities, we also have to keep our eye on the, on, on the outpatient environment, which is also expanding quickly. Now, I mentioned that the strategic plan was being implemented well. But I wanted to make the point that we didn't stop planning with the strategic plan. A lot of new activities have come up since then, and they'll come up continuously. And I could cite a number, but I just want to you know, recognize the field of epigenetics that we, we know is a cutting edge field that requires additional engagement and, and investment going forward. You see here the, the biobanking. We've invested in additional uh, microscopic uh, facilities as part of the core. Kevin, you, uh, among others, convinced us that we need a super resolution microscopy to stay on the cutting edge. You know, I have a mantra that I'm sure most of you would share. If we've got the right people who are armed with the right kinds of resources and tools, and the right culture will thrive. So I think it's very important that we not only retain and attract outstanding faculty, but we make sure that they're cutting edge tools to work with. Informatics is, is another example. Here's uh, next generation sequencing. Now, in this case, uh, we made the decision not to go all out in a single step, but to recognize that this technology would evolve quickly over time. And so we've been able to continuously take on uh, the next generation of the next generation, and often at lower cost. So I'm going to, to close with the horizon as we look forward. Um, I'm very confident about the state of Penn Medicine, and I'm confident in the state of Penn Medicine because of the quality of, of all of you in the room and the rest of our faculty, the quality of the students, the planning we've done, the investments that we're, that we're making, and the progress that we see as we, as we measure everything that we're doing. But I, I did want to emphasize what I think is a defining feature for us. And it's the fact that our, our basic discoveries 
which are happening every week at Penn, are so strongly tied in our integrated system to clinical questions and innovation. So our, our basic scientists are made aware of the problems that need to be solved. And they're able to offer potential solutions uh, to those in the clinical environment. Our centers and institutes are the catalysts that connect them up. And they've been working incredibly effectively. So this is the combination of, of basic discovery with clinical innovation catalyzed by the centers and institutes. We've got outstanding people you know, armed with tools. And I think I made the, the point about our cultural features that help foster success. So thanks so much for coming out this afternoon. Thank you for everything that you do. We'll be holding a reception out, outside, and I look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>